Good evening, I'm Nick Schifrin. Judy Woodruff is away. On the news hour tonight, a dire warning from the United Nations. Climate change threatens a food and water crisis around the world. Then a massive raid. Immigrations and customs enforcement officers arrest more than 600 undocumented workers at food processing plants across Mississippi. Plus, five years after the police killing of Michael Brown, we examine efforts to reform Ferguson, Missouri. When Michael Brown Jr. was killed, it changed the lives of so many people, not just here in Ferguson, but throughout the entire world. Um, it changed my life. I never, ever would have thought that I would have been a politician, but I found something that I could do that would help my community. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major fun. The United Nations is sounding a dire new warning about how the way we use our land is increasing the effects of climate change. A report out today from an international panel of more than 100 scientists found that the world's land and water resources are being exploited at, quote, unprecedented rates. And it said large-scale farming, along with the global consumption of meat and dairy, are fueling climate change in a way that could produce a food crisis. We'll take a closer look at these findings after the news summary. More than 200 former altar boys, students, and Boy Scouts in Guam are suing the U.S. territory's Catholic diocese for sexual abuse that dates back to the 1950s. The Associated Press reported they were assaulted by clergy, teachers, and scout leaders linked to the church. The island's former archbishop, Anthony Operon, is one of those named. The Vatican convicted him of sex abuse in 2016, but he still remains a bishop and receives a stipend from the church. In the wake of two deadly mass shootings, more than 200 U.S. mayors are urging senators to return to Washington and pass gun safety legislation. In a letter addressed to Senate leaders today, the mayors called for a vote on two bills that have passed the House and expand background checks for gun sales. Among them was Mayor Non Whaley of Dayton, Ohio, where nine people were shot dead this weekend. She spoke to reporters alongside Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. My focus is getting something done around gun control so this terrible, tragic incident in Dayton may not have to happen in other places. President Trump has said he supports background check legislation, but those words have yet to translate to action. And Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has resisted pressure to call senators back from their August recess over concerns the bills won't have enough Republican support. The State Department lashed out at China today for disclosing the photograph and personal information of a U.S. diplomat who met with leaders of Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. The State Department spokeswoman, Megan Ortegas, insisted China's actions were, quote, completely unacceptable. Okay. I don't think that, that leaking an American diplomat's uh, private information, pictures, names of their children, I don't think that that's a formal protest. That is what a thuggish regime would do. That's not how a responsible nation would, would behave. Pro-democracy protesters have filled Hong Kong streets for the last few months, demanding democratic reforms. Mainland China has criticized them, and Hong Kong police have arrested nearly 600. The demonstrators plan to hold another major protest at Hong Kong's international airport this weekend. Former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe filed a lawsuit today against the Bureau and the Justice Department over his firing. McCabe insisted his termination last year was in retaliation for his, quote, refusal to pledge allegiance to President Trump. He was fired after a Justice Department inspector general found he leaked information to the media and then lied about it to investigators. McCabe played a key role in the FBI's probe into Russian interference in the 2016 election. And stocks rallied on Wall Street today, boosted by gains in the technology sector. The Dow Jones Industrial Average soared 371 points to close at 26,378. The Nasdaq rose 176 points, and the S&P 500 added 54. Still to come on the news hour, a U.N. report paints a dire picture of the impact of human land use on climate change. Hundreds are arrested in immigration raids at Mississippi food processing plants and much more. It is a dire warning. The latest science paints a picture of a future in the grips of extreme weather. William Brangham reports on how much impact climate change and the way we use our land will have on the very basics of life.
If we don't quickly change the way we grow our food and manage the land on Earth, we will not be able to avoid the worst damages from climate change. That grim assessment comes from a new report issued today in Geneva by the United Nations Intel Panel on Climate Change. Over 100 experts from 53 nations contributed to the report. The report details a global feedback loop where our land management makes climate change worse and then climate change impacts the land even more. Right now, how we grow food, chop down forests, and drain wetlands contributes about 23% of human greenhouse gas emissions. For example, the report notes that the soils essential for growing food are being lost 10 to 100 times faster than they're being replenished. As that soil degrades, crop yields will fall and the soil itself loses its natural ability to absorb greenhouse gases, which then makes climate change worse and perpetuates the cycle. According to the report, about 500 million people live in areas that are turning quickly to desert. These millions of people are increasingly vulnerable to heat waves and floods and may soon find their homes unlivable. The report does offer some hope, pointing out how better land management could reverse some of these trends. It also suggests things like reducing food waste, because one third of all food that's produced gets wasted, and shifting our diet away from meat, which requires far more energy to produce than a plant-based diet. For more on what this report says and how we ought to respond, I'm joined by Janet Ranganathan. She's the Vice President for Science and Research at the World Resources Institute. Welcome to the News Hour. This report seems to lay out the essential paradox of modern life, which is the way we have grown food and, and managed the lands all over the planet have built this incredible society that we live in, but now we realize that those exact methods imperil that society, right? Isn't that what this is saying? Yes, exactly. One, one of the key messages of this report is that the food system um, and the land use changes associated with that food system are a significant factor in contributing to climate change. <clears throat> and these other factors, such as deforestation. Um, in fact, you know, it, it, it is impossible um, to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement without significant changes to the food system. And that includes both production and consumption. So this report puts that issue squarely on the table. What are the specific things that we do globally to the land that are, that are problematic, as detailed in this report? Well, the, the first thing is um, we, we need to use land to produce food. That's a good thing. I mean, I, we haven't developed a, another um, substitute for land yet. Um, but how much land we use and at the expense of natural ecosystems like forests has become quite problematic. So, you know, food, the expansion of the agricultural frontier is the major driver of deforestation, which contributes, releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, creates climate change, which in turn impacts agriculture. But changing the way in which we manage lands all over the world yep. is such a fraught process. I mean, just getting the political will and the governments to do this. I mean, just simply look at Brazil. The Amazon is one of the most essential parts of our environmental ecosystem, and yet they've elected a president who's ready to fire up the chainsaws. Yep. So, you know, there are very compelling arguments why countries should be managing the agricultural footprint. Uh, in ways that sort of minimize that and protect forests, not just for climate reasons. I mean, the Amazon, it is a climate regulation system, but moreover, it's actually a water regulation system for that whole region there. So if you keep chipping away at the Amazon, not only are you gonna contribute to climate problem, but at some point, the scientist says that Amazon could reach a tipping point where it sort of suddenly switches over and becomes a more savanna-like vegetation. If that happens, the whole rainfall system in that region, which is a, a large breadbasket of the world, will, will, will um, be severely affected. So what are some of the other things that we could do? I mean, as you say, we still have to grow crops and, and food out of the land that we live on. Yep. What are the other things that they suggest we ought to do? So one of the things it uh, correctly noted was that um, food loss and waste is a massive thing. Um, globally, it's about a quarter of calories between field and fork are either wasted or lost. In the US, it's 
probably a significant amount higher. And how does that happen? How does, is that, it's lost in transport, it's lost in, it, after we purchase it, how, how does that? All of those. Um, in developing countries, low-income countries, it tends to be, you know, the lack of infrastructure, refrigeration, packaging. In developed countries, you know, rich countries like the U.S., it's more of, you know, you, you purchase something, you put it in your fridge, you decide to go out to dinner. Um, you're confused by the sell-by date. You think, you know, eat by means it's no good anymore. You toss it in the trash. So, you know, cutting food loss and waste. Um, food loss and waste, I mean, food waste is wasted land, it's wasted water, it's, you know, wasted greenhouse gas emissions, and it's wasted money. So taking a bite out of the, you know, that land that we need to produce agriculture, this is a very effective way. The report also suggests that globally we ought to change our diet, eating less meat and more plants and vegetables and fruits. How important is that in this process? Critical. And I'm very glad to see that in the report. The World Resources Institute came out with a report quite recently, creating a sustainable food future. There was also the Eat Lancet report, all put this issue of um, diets on the issue. And the reason is that not all foods are equal in terms of their greenhouse gas impact. So beef, for example, produces 22, sorry, produces 20 times as much greenhouse gas emissions per an ounce of protein as, say, a plant-based protein like beans or lentils. So 20 times more. It's a huge dichotomy. So, yeah. People think about, oh, where does my food come from? How was it produced? Yes, that does affect greenhouse gas emissions. But more significant is, what do I choose to eat? That's probably going to have the most profound impact on the diet-related emissions that you have. Changing again the global diet. I mean, you think about India and China and all of those populations moving into the middle class and upper middle class. What do they do? They adopt American eating habits. They eat more meat. Again, it seems like the, we're moving in the opposite direction. Yep. And there's things we can do to shift that. I mean, here in the United States, since the 70s, there's been about uh, the, the per capita consumption of beef has fallen by about a third. So it's already starting to happen. I mean, and there, are, there are health reasons to do that. There are maybe cost reasons. Um, so there's strategies that we can use in developed countries to shift diets. Food services companies are starting to use some of these. And in developing countries where they're worried about, you know, you know spiraling health care costs, I actually think they can start to put in place the right public, you know, education, incentives, um, and educational programs to, to, to knit this in bud and allow them to sort of peak at a, a lower meat, maximum meat, than what's happened in, in rich countries. Uh, lastly, there's been a lot of talk, especially in the presidential campaign here in the U.S., about the time frame for action. Do we have 10 years, 12 years in order to act? Does this report address that at all? Um, no, it doesn't specifically address the window that we have to try and stabilize uh, or limit uh, global average temperature rise. Um, but other IPCC reports have. Um, we're talking about a very short and narrowing window of around 10 to 15 years now. So action really needs to have happened yesterday. Janet Ranganathan from the World Resources Institute. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having us on the show. Stay with us. Coming up on the news hour, international tensions rise in Kashmir as India revokes the region's special status. Five years after the death of Michael Brown, we examine the efforts to reform Ferguson, Missouri. And one Alaskan artist looks to glaciers for musical inspiration. President Trump has made immigration a centerpiece of his presidency, and Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, has been on the front lines. Today, ICE officials released 300 of the nearly 700 people they arrested yesterday in workplace sweeps across Mississippi. Authorities called it the largest single state action of its kind in U.S. history. As Jeffrey Brown reports, the raids targeted immigrant workers employed in local food processing plants. The raids involved more than 600 federal officers in an action authorities said had been in the planning for more than a year and fell on the second day of school in the area. For more on the raids and what has happened since, we turn to Hamid Ali Aziz, immigration reporter for BuzzFeed. Hamid, thanks for joining us. What do we know about why these particular plants were raided? Well, ICE officials are unwilling at this point to give any details on the investigation. They say simply that you know, this was a matter of uh, a long time coming. This investigation has been going on for nearly a year. 
and uh, they just simply carried out search warrants and that the investigation's ongoing and they can't say much more. What happened to those taken into custody? We, we know that many were already released, but under what conditions? Yeah, so at this point, uh, three, around 300 individuals have been released and given orders to return to immigration court. Uh, so these individuals will have to appear uh, for uh, their first hearings, perhaps, uh, to, to begin the uh, deportation proceedings. And what about those still in custody? Those in custody, ICE has yet to tell us uh, where they've been detained, but they do say that uh, these around uh, 370 uh, individuals will be sent to detention centers in Mississippi and Louisiana, uh, where ICE has uh, expanded its uh, detention space. Is there a sense that these companies know full well that the workers were illegal and couldn't otherwise fill the jobs with citizens? What, what do we know? We don't know anything at this point. I mean, that's a tough thing about this situation is all we have is nearly 700 undocumented, suspected undocumented workers were arrested, and that's all ICE is willing to give us at this point. Uh, we should learn more as the days come, as search warrants and the, uh, the, you know, the documents surrounding the search warrants become unsealed. Uh, but at this point, this, we, we are left with only the, the arrests of the unauthorized workers. As you said, the government has said this was long in the works. Uh, there were people who noted that it had occurred right after the El Paso shootings. What, have you heard any connection or what have you been hearing? No, again, they say, uh, ICE officials say that uh, the search warrants were ready to go. They got signed uh, and delivered from the a judge and they executed them uh, simply because they got those warrants. It wasn't at all tied with uh, the shooting, uh, obviously local, uh, advocates and other individuals have, uh, you know, said that they were disturbed at the, the timing so close to that shooting in El Paso. So what happens next? What happens next is uh, these communities are, uh, you know, going to be left with trying to pick up the pieces. Uh, kids uh, potentially have parents uh, in detention, one parent at home. Um, and, uh, you know, already today we are seeing the effects. I've spoken to several school districts who've said that uh, they've seen a, a, a pretty substantial drop in school attendance. So uh, at this point, uh, you know, much will be remain to seen as whether these communities are, you know, continue to, to, to thrive. I know you're watching this issue all around the country. Is the expectation that there are other ongoing investigations and other very large raids like this coming? Yeah, I mean, I think we should expect that. The administration has said, uh, and, and starting at the beginning of last year, that they would ramp up these so-called worksite enforcement operations. Uh, we've already seen some pretty big operations last year with a couple hundred people being arrested at one facility. But this is really, uh, you know, just so massive in scope, nearly 700 people. So I think, you know, perhaps this could be the beginning of a new era of, uh, you know, major worksite operations. All right. Hamid Ali Aziz of BuzzFeed, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And now a closer focus on how Wednesday's raids are affecting the community, especially children with a parent in custody. Tony McGee is superintendent of Scott County Public Schools. And thank you for joining us. So what did happen in the classrooms and after school yesterday? Well, we got notified somewhere around 8.30 yesterday morning that uh, there was a potential ice raid at some of the processing plants in Scott County. Uh, we knew from that that potentially some of our parents might be those detainees. We had parents started coming into school somewhere around nine o'clock to check children out of school. Uh, had some neighbors and friends coming to check children out of school. And so we started uh, a process of trying to identify uh, maybe those uh, students uh, and those parents that may have been detained. So what's the situation today? We've heard of a uh, number of people being released from custody, but what's the situation in the schools? We had, a, we had approximately 154 students across our district, uh, mainly uh, Hispanic and Latino of nature uh, that were absent from school today. And so we've started reaching out to uh, those uh, families uh, to find out about boys and girls, where they're at, uh, how they're doing, uh, just making sure that they know school is a safe place for them. It can be a safe harbor for boys and girls and, and that we're here to you know, care for those kids. What kind of response did you see from uh, volunteers or the, the larger community? And we've had a tremendous response. It uh, started early yesterday. Once the word got out, uh, people started calling, coming. Uh, we have a, a lot of organizations in, in Scott County that are deeply rooted into the Hispanic community. 
Uh, and so they uh, came to lend support to our school people as we try to translate um, a different language and making sure that everybody felt safe. We've had a tremendous amount of support uh, across the nation today, everything from California to New Jersey. Uh, people have contacted us about what can they do for uh, not only in monetary, but what can they do for boys and girls uh, to provide an environment for them. On our end, especially in the community and the school, we had no prior knowledge. And so it was it was pretty, uh, pretty shocking. Uh, it was really a tough day emotionally for educators and students and families. Uh, as far as uh, local law enforcement, as far as I understand, they, they had very limited knowledge or no knowledge of it too. So uh, it was one of those things that uh, it, uh, we, we found out about it uh, after it happened. All right, Superintendent Tony McGee, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Following two mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton, Ohio, mental health is again in the spotlight. As more Americans seek treatment, the healthcare system and lawmakers can't keep up. For some Californians who have struggled with a severe mental illness, the road to long-term care sometimes begins with a stop behind bars. The largest mental, the largest mental institution in California, rather, is the Los Angeles County Jail. Miranda Lyons of Cal Matters, a nonprofit, nonpartisan media organization, examines how the mental health system is failing some of the most vulnerable. You know, kept tapping me on the shoulder, Mom, look at that white car. That white car's following us. That's the government, that's the CIA. Joanna Jurgens noticed something wrong with her son, Jeffrey, on a family trip to Tahoe, California. This is him in junior high. He was 17, it was his first psychotic break and the beginning of his years-long struggle with schizoaffective disorder. Over the next four years, Jeffrey landed in jail frequently. I, I remember saying to the judge in El Dorado County, I, I, I need help, he needs help and I don't know what to do. But I, we're, we're waiting for a disaster to happen. But he said, the law, my hands, there's nothing I can really do. His time in jail and on the streets gave him an unlikely friend. Mental health 12, I'm in a route to the... Officer Michelle Lazark. I saw Jeffrey sitting on a, a, a bench. He didn't have any clothes on. He was a little disheveled. And I said, hey, are you a new guy? And he says, well, yes, I am. Across the country, more than 90% of patrol officers encounter about six people experiencing a mental health crisis each month according to the U.S. Department of Justice. Okay, great. This is going to be great. You're going to get treatment. You're going to need the help you need. You're going to get housed. And they just can't keep it together. Following Jeffrey's arrest from stealing a car, a judge finally witnessed what Jurgens' mother had been saying for years, that he was sick. The judge was trying to talk to him, and then he, my son just started yelling out that, you know, who, do you, who the F do you think you are? And, I'm Jesus Christ. Instead of jail, he was sent to the Atascadero State Mental Hospital, where he's been for the past five years. We're here talking about mental health, and that's my 27-year-old son. Latanya Dandy's son, Christopher, had his first psychotic break at 19. Since then, when Dandy has turned to law enforcement for help, officials say their hands are tied. So they say, ma'am, we can't do anything because it'll violate his civil rights. California, like most states, makes it difficult to compel people to get treatment. I'm like, civil rights, your officer just heard him screaming like somebody was attacking him, and I'm on the phone with him a few seconds ago. He was like, well, we can't do anything. But Dandy's son was now in more desperate straits. At the time, he was homeless. For those with mental health issues, finding affordable housing is nearly impossible. For the few who have found a place to live, the options are dwindling. Nationally, about a third of people with a serious mental illness are homeless. I hate to uh, be homeless again. I was homeless about 20 years before I came here. Tom Gray has schizophrenia. For the past 11 years, the Vietnam vet has lived at this San Francisco boarding care home. 
Since 2012, more than a quarter of residential facilities in San Francisco serving people under 60 have closed their doors. Nationwide, small boarding care homes like where Tom lives have lost about 15,000 beds between 2010 and 2016, according to a survey by the National Center for Health Statistics. Not knowing where I'm going to go next. That's how, that's how I feel kind of lost. Gray has found a temporary house in San Francisco, but he will have to move again in a few months. A bill winding through the state legislature would triple the number of people who can use Medicaid dollars to live in boarding care homes, but it still has a long way to go. There isn't a big uh, political action committee uh, well-funded for mentally ill people, okay? <laughs> it doesn't exist. State Senator Jim Bell of San Jose, California, created the state's first mental health caucus. He's trying to not only increase housing options, but also create avenues for the judicial system to deal with those with mental health issues. All rise. Department 61 is now... It's mental health court. The Honorable Judge Stephen Manley is presiding. Our jails are overcrowded. Our prisons are overcrowded. The crime rate has really not changed dramatically, yet we have more and more people incarcerated, and so we have to do something different. There are more than 300 mental health courts across the country in nearly every state. Instead of jail time, Judge Stephen Manley orders people to take their medication, stay sober, and send some to community treatment programs. You're not in jail anymore, so it's so much better. Breathe the clean air. Ah, just keep it up, okay? While Judge Manley works to keep people out of prisons and state hospitals, for people like Jeffrey Jurgens, the treatment and structure at the hospital is often the best option. Once a month, Joanna Jurgens makes this four-hour drive to visit her son. It's good and bad to say that your, 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 your kid is happy in a state hospital. For parents like Joanna Jurgens, LaTanya Dandy, and many others, state laws and resources continue to be a challenge for getting their children help. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Baronda Lyons in Sacramento, California. Today, in a part of the world that has helped spark three wars, tens of thousands of troops are patrolling the streets. They are Indian government forces in Indian-controlled Kashmir. And it's been four days since the Indian government changed the status of Kashmir, which is India's only Muslim-majority region. Up until this week, Kashmir had a large degree of autonomy. The government's decision has sparked protests over a long-disputed area claimed by both India and Pakistan, where fighting has killed tens of thousands of people over the last few decades. Today in Kashmir, the streets are empty. Soldiers enforce a strict military curfew. Hundreds have been arrested. Fear has driven many inside, and many others are trying to leave but are stuck with limited transport. The government made the situation worse. There are no arrangements for us to leave. Nor is there any arrangement for food. We have been lying here, hungry. In an unprecedented clampdown, India has blocked internet and phone in the primarily Muslim region. And today, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi called this, quote, the beginning of a new era. I and the whole nation have taken a historic decision, an arrangement in which our brothers and sisters from Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh had been deprived of their rights, which have been a great obstacle in their development has been removed as a result of all our efforts. On Monday, Modi's government lifted Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, which enabled Kashmiris to write their own laws. India says it's a national security decision because Pakistan has supported militant groups who have launched many attacks inside Kashmir. We will all get together and rid Jammu and Kashmir of terrorism and separatism. Ease of living will increase for our citizens. But critics describe the Modi government as overtly biased in favor of the majority Hindu population at the expense of India's 180 million Muslims. Protesters demonstrated in New Delhi and in Karachi, Pakistan, where they burned an effigy of Modi. 
Pakistan halted trade with India, downgraded diplomatic relations, and criticized India for its move in what Pakistan calls Indian-occupied Kashmir, or IOK, Pakistan's foreign ministry spokesman. IOK has been converted into the largest prison in the world and in the history of mankind. More than 14 million humans are incarcerated in their homes. Last month, President Trump met with Pakistan's prime minister and offered his assistance. If I could help, I would love to be a mediator. But there's a reason why prior presidents have avoided that offer. Kashmir is located at the northernmost tip of the Indian subcontinent, at the nexus of India, Pakistan, and China. Kashmir has been in dispute since the 1947 partition. India now controls the larger portion. The two sides are separated by the line of control. The countries fought over control over Kashmir in 1947 and in a larger war in 1971. Conflict sparked again in 1999. The two nuclear nations were pushed into a ceasefire over concerns of a nuclear war. But the conflict has long simmered. Today, Pakistan suspended the Friendship Express train that runs across the border and warned that tensions could remain high. And we examine where things go from here with Ambassador Frank Wisner. He had a nearly 40-year diplomatic career and served in senior positions in both the state and defense departments during Republican and Democratic administrations. He was ambassador to India during the Clinton administration. Ambassador, thank you very much for coming on the news hour. Fundamentally, what does it mean that Kashmir's status has been shifted? Well, it means a great deal. Um, the regime under which Kashmir has lived since the late 1940s has given it a measure of autonomy that mixes very deeply with the psychology and sense of belonging of the overwhelming majority of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, removing that is uh, going to understandably create a great deal of ruction. It will create a lot of emotion across the border with Pakistan and it will create a certain amount of attention on the global stage. And we've seen that emotion both in India and Pakistan and global stage. Here we are talking about it. Uh, the BJP, the uh, ruling party uh, in India, and its prime minister, Narendra Modi, have been talking about this move for a long time. But why do you think they've made it now? Well, that's precisely the point. They have signaled well in advance that the party, if returned, with a new mandate would go to parliament and seek a change that would not only end the special status, but would sever the territory of Jammu and Kashmir into two portions and have them both centrally ruled. They chose this time, and they chose it very carefully, once they had in place a comprehensive plan to control the consequences of a political decision that the government made very carefully. They deployed forces, they closed off telecommunications, they've closed down radio, they've picked up people who might be in opposition. It was a carefully set out and very carefully deployed plan. And you said that they would be able to accept or manage the political consequences. Will there be political consequences for them for this move? They've taken all the legal steps the uh, Indian system would call for. Will that calm the passions of those on the ground in Kashmir? No, it won't. Um, will it make others uneasy, Indian Muslims? Will it calm uh, those in Pakistan who continue to claim that Pakistan has a legitimate say in the future of Kashmir? None of those will happen. The government's not trying to satisfy those audiences. We saw in the story that played just a few minutes ago President Trump weighing in on this when he was asked by Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, in the Oval Office. He said that he would not mind being a mediator. Did that statement impact the timing of this? In my view, it did not. Um, this was much too carefully planned. There were too many moving parts in play. I can't say that the president's statement received anything but uh, negative reactions in India, but I don't think it was a triggering event. You talked about the emotions running high. Uh, we saw protests both in Delhi and, of course, uh, in multiple places in Pakistan. Uh, how fundamental is this for Pakistan? Uh, you know, these countries have fought three wars in the past. Is this something that could cause there uh, to be more conflict? 
Well, I'm not, I do not predict that there will be open conflict between India and Pakistan. I think that's probably unlikely. But will there be a rise in the short run in jihadi terrorist attempts to cross the border uh, from Pakistan into uh, Indian, the Indian side? I think that's highly possible. Uh, can you imagine uh, circumstances in which there will be a higher level of militancy within uh, Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir? I can imagine that as well. But I don't see overall warfare between the two sides. What one must worry about, though, is with an increase in low-level jihadi violence that India retaliates, Pakistan retaliates, and you can have a very unpleasant circumstance. And fundamentally, is that the main U.S. interest here, that these two countries' uh, conflict does not happen and tensions decrease? Well, clearly, that's an American interest. But I would underscore a separate point. India is a great nation. It is a major factor on the world stage. We're moving into a world order in which large nations have to keep some sense of balance. We need a balanced relationship with India. We are not in a position to tell India what to do one way or the other. India will pursue its own ambitions and its government elected with an overwhelming majority has taken this decision, whether that's a popular one outside of India or inside Kashmir or Pakistan, it is the decision of the Indian government and they intend to make it stick. Ambassador Frank Wisner, thank you so much. Thank you. Tomorrow marks the fifth anniversary of the day Michael Brown Jr. was shot and killed by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. His death touched off months of protests and raised questions about the police's use of force, race relations, and criminal justice in the U.S. Political correspondent Yamiche Alcindor traveled back to Ferguson to see what progress has and hasn't been made. A typical summer barbecue near what some see as hallowed ground. It was here five years ago that Officer Darren Wilson shot and killed 18-year-old Michael Brown. To me, that just little patch just reminds me of exactly where it happened at. I can't drive over it. I don't know what that is. I don't know how to explain that or why, but I can't. I drive around it. Fran Griffin helped organize this event as part of the Southeast Ferguson Community Association. The group was formed in the wake of Brown's death to provide community services. Like many others, Griffin was spurred to protest after Brown was killed. And earlier this year, she won a seat on Ferguson City Council, becoming the first black woman to represent her ward. When Michael Brown Jr. was killed, it changed, it changed the lives of so many people, not just here in Ferguson, but throughout the entire world. Um, it changed my life. I never ever would have thought that I would have been a politician, but I found something that I could do that would help my community. <laughs> Brown's death thrust Ferguson, a city of 22,000, into the national spotlight. Images of police and armored vehicles firing tear gas at protesters and demonstrators setting fire to businesses fueled intense debate. Now, as another anniversary approaches, many are taking stock of what has changed. We have a lot of new uh, staff members around City Hall. We have a lot of new staff uh, people, especially in the police department. We have a lot of new uh, council members. James Knowles is mayor of Ferguson. He is one of the few remaining city officials from 2014. He remains the target of intense criticism, but insists the city has made meaningful strides. We have uh, a tremendous amount of new officers in our police department, a much more diverse police department uh, than we had in the past. Our courts are much more focused on uh, working with people to uh, not get caught in that kind of cycle of being uh, in, in the court system through traffic tickets or housing fines. Of course, many of those reforms were mandated by a Justice Department consent decree. In 2015, the DOJ concluded law enforcement practices in Ferguson were, quote, shaped by the city's focus on revenue rather than public safety needs. It also determined that African Americans were arrested at disproportionate rates and some without probable cause. 
Statewide, black drivers are still nearly twice as likely as others to be stopped. In Ferguson, the disparity in traffic stops of black drivers has also increased by 5 percent since 2013. Yet Ferguson has reduced its ticketing. In 2014, the city issued nearly 12,000 tickets. Most were for minor municipal code violations. In 2017, that number was just under 2,000. Now revenue has fallen from nearly $2 million in 2014 to just under $400,000 in 2017. The municipal court has also vacated nearly 10,000 arrest warrants. There have also been broader changes. We know this issue isn't limited to the borders of Ferguson. Last year, Wesley Bell was elected St. Louis County Prosecutor. The former Ferguson City Councilman defeated longtime Republican Bob McCullough, who declined to indict yeah, Officer Wilson. It was more of the, the, the typical um, incarcerate your way out of, of every problem. Um, someone is struggling to, to, to pay child support, put them on probation or lock them up. Someone has a drug issue, put them on probation or lock them up and that exacerbates the problem. Any of you who work the street know you're seeing the same people over and over who just need treatment. Instead, he is prioritizing pre-trial diversion programs, cash bail reform, and decriminalizing low-level drug charges. We want to make sure that people um, um, who are incarcerated need to be incarcerated, and those that do not need to be should not see the inside of a jail. Since Bell has been in office, St. Louis County's jail population has dropped by 20%. There are still serious questions over just how much change has come to Ferguson. Storefronts like these remain shuttered and development is slow. And there are still stark racial divisions and deep tensions between the community and the police. Councilwoman Griffin worries the third ward, which has the highest percentage of black residents and the lowest income levels, is not getting enough resources. In terms of just the little small mom and pop stores like those aren't existing. You've got a few beauty supply houses, you've got a few beauty salons and nail shops, um, but in terms of actually providing resources to people where they can, in walking distance, where they can go and shop, I would say no. Last week, a Missouri nonprofit announced plans for a new development project. It will include a health center and possibly a grocery store. Still, some in the city remain deeply worried about interactions with the police and racial profiling. If anything, it feels the same, you know, I don't feel like nothing different. I don't feel like it has enhanced or anything like that. I, I don't even feel like I can call the police to save myself. Marcus Hicks and Travis Bowl, both 22, live in Ferguson and saw the protests here in 2014. Like being a black male, it's just, like I feel like it's, it's just like it's never gonna change. Like they go forever think we on some, 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 some type of BS or some type of gang banging stuff and stuff like that. Yet some wrongly believe black residents deserve extra scrutiny. If you watch how some of these people drive, you know what, you know what color they are. I'm not prejudiced, but we can tell by the way they drive. Judy McCarty has lived in Ferguson since she was two and lives just blocks from where Brown was killed. And while her husband, William, says some court reforms were needed. When you come in to pay a ticket and you've got four other outstanding warrants and they put you in jail. You can't pay your fine if you're in jail. You're not going to be working. Still, they worry things have gone too far. Let's not go the opposite way where the, the way they seem to be going now is and there's no punishment for abusing the law. Uh, uh, right. At the same time, Ferguson's independent monitor testified the city needs to do more to actually implement policy changes, including new police training. But Mayor Knowles says the costs are too high, which has rankled many activists. There is no police department in Missouri, very few in this country, that do all of the things that are required by our consent decree. We have to go through more hoops. We have to endure more training, more scrutiny. To them, the mindset is it's not fair that we're being penalized because of what happened here, because everybody else was doing it. That's the wrong mindset to have. Griffin says it's that kind of sentiment that makes her concerned the city may revert to its old practices. But she's also confident in the momentum of the last five years. Whenever I pass up the space, like it's a constant reminder of the what my responsibilities are. Um, it's a constant reminder of the pain that an entire community felt. And it's just a constant reminder that we gotta keep fighting.
For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Yami Michelle Sendor in Ferguson, Missouri. We return to climate change, but on a very different note. Valerie Kern of Alaska Public Media explores how one artist is examining the melting of glaciers to create music. It's part of our ongoing arts and culture coverage, Canvas. I was out recording the wind sounds, and I was, it was really snowy and icy, and I came back down you know, into the building, and I was just covered in like ice on my beard and snow, and you know, my, my, everything was frozen up, and, and someone said, Matthew, what are you doing? And I said, I'm composing. Well, I'm a composer and a sound artist and an eco-acoustician. So I, I work with environmental sounds and I create music and sound art uh, in dialogue with nature. So I particularly focus on climate change. So, you know, I'm interested in composing music that reflects changes in our climate. And I try to bring attention to that and work with the natural world as a musical instrument. So I'm very often composing with glaciers and with the snow or the wind and things, any way that I can discover how we hear climate change. By thumping it, I hear like the snowbank as a bass drum. You know, some days I'm out in the mountains listening and recording sounds. There are days where I sit at the computer programming. There are days when I sit at a music paper writing music. No, it's never dull. I made an album called Glacier Music. It's published, so it kind of fixes in time snapshots of these glaciers. As the glaciers are retreating, they go through a rapid kind of time of retreat, and that has a certain sonic signature. And then the glacier goes through a period of thinning. And you can hear that too because the, the water that's thinning comes out of the glacier on the sides and usually makes these rushing rivers along the sides of the glaciers. That sound to me is a, is a signature sound of a glacier that's an advanced retreat. When I was studying music, I was impressed by the sounds of the natural world and in general the power and the presence of the Alaskan wilderness. And so I naturally made music with those things. As I got older, the, you know, the environment started changing and I started hearing those changes in the sounds that I loved. I want people to feel something. If the music is made by a glacier, for example, will we feel more connected to the glaciers and think about them in a different way? Through composing these pieces, we're kind of documenting the world now. And in the future, maybe the glacier like Matanuska will sound very different, if it sounds at all. And I still hope that we can change that, that the glaciers won't disappear. It's stressful to think about, you know, a million species of animals being becoming extinct in the next few years, you know, to think about all the Arctic animals that are among those million. Like, what can I do to help with that? Is the music really gonna stop the extinctions? No, it's not. Maybe the music can be used in a kind of joined science, policy, art discourse that, that does change that in some way.
finally tonight, a brief but spectacular on taking on stereotypes in Hollywood. Actor, actor and singer Utkarsh Ambudkar's latest film is Britney Runs a Marathon. Once again, as part of our Canvas series, he reflects on how he has adopted to Hollywood and Hollywood has adopted to him. As a South Asian man, um, the roles that we get are very finite. And I say no to quite a few things. Like, we don't do computer nerds and we don't do sidekicks. So music and acting have always gone hand in hand for me. I was in a hip hop group, a trio, much like the Beastie Boys. How did Pitch Perfect happen? Let's let's rewind, guys. Pick a verse, any verse, I'll hypnotize you with every line. Mindy Kaling saw Pitch Perfect. I got offered the role of her little brother, Rishi, on the Mindy Project. White Famous was for Showtime, and that role was written for a light-skinned black actor. I improvised an Indian, South Asian spin on that role in the room. You gotta do something, Floyd. I've been acting professionally since 2005. Around 2018 is when people realized asking me to do an accent when it wasn't period or geographically appropriate was offensive. Now I can walk into a room and call it out and people kinda have to they accept it. What does that conversation sound like in the room? So I've been in auditions where they wrote a line in their show about um, an Indian teacher with a strong accent saying that he would sell 10 goats to get a woman like that in his classroom. So this is offensive and I told my manager, no, there's no way I'm gonna do this. So my manager said, okay, go in, you can put your own spin on it, they're fine. So I go and I do my no accent and my improv. He said, can you just do it the way that I wrote it? You want me to do it the way you wrote it? Like even this line about the goats? The sauce on what I said was so thick that there was only one interpretation to take from it. And uh, that's not how you do business and it's not how we should communicate with each other. Um, in any case, that's my responsibility. But his responsibility is to not write, write a piece of that's offensive, right? Now, when I walk into a room, and it just happened on Mulan, I just went and did this Disney movie, and there were some challenges with sort of um, the way that our ethnicities were being um, portrayed. And I was able to go into the room with Disney. I mean, it's a giant conglomerate. And the script was changed and moved around and built and enhanced to sort of speak to some of the concerns that we had. You'd think that's just how it's supposed to go, but it's one of the first few times that it's starting to happen for me where I can be like, hey, I see a problem here and people actually listen. My name is Utkar Shambutkar, and this is my brief but spectacular take on making it up as I go along. You can find additional brief but spectacular episodes on our website, pbs.org slash newshour slash brief. And a news update before we go. President Trump confirmed this evening the Deputy Director of National Intelligence, Sue Gordon, is resigning effective next week. It is the latest shakeup at the top of U.S. intelligence agencies. Dan Coats, the Director of National Intelligence, is also leaving his post next week. Congressman John Rathcliffe withdrew from consideration to be the next DNI after concerns he inflated his resume and did not have enough intelligence experience. It is unclear who will be named acting head. The job oversees the nation's 17 intelligence agencies. And that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Nick Schifrin. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening where our series on Ferguson five years later continues on the personal toll of Michael Brown's death. Plus, David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart break down the latest in the 2020 race for president as the Iowa State Fair kicks off. For all of us at the PBS NewsHour, I hope you had a good day. Thank you and see you soon. PBS.